Today we're going to talk about what we would check and what we'd inspect on an 80% gas furnace. It starts off with your safety. So what you're going to do is have your carbon monoxide monitor. You're going to turn this on outside the house. You don't want to turn this on while you're inside because many of these are going to zero out to its conditions. So if we have, say, 10 parts per million of carbon monoxide in the house, this is going to zero out at 10 parts per million. So it's going to show us as zero, even though we already have a high level of carbon monoxide. So you want to turn this on outside. I'm not going to turn this one on right now because the noise that it's going to make, it's going to interfere with the recording. But this is what I would have. It has a magnet on it. I would leave it run the whole entire time I'm working. And I'd also take this through the house to make sure that we don't have any carbon monoxide leaking anywhere in the house. Just because you have carbon monoxide doesn't mean that you have a bad furnace, but it does mean you definitely need to find out where it's coming from. I also recommend taking a course on carbon monoxide and combustion analysis. I also want to look to see if the customer has any kind of low level CO monitor. They should have a carbon monoxide alarm or even better the low level CO monitor. These low level CO monitors are what's really going to keep the customer safe because a lot of the alarms don't sound off until it's 70 parts per million over a certain amount of time. Whereas this is going to show your parts per million as you go. So I always want to have this, recommend this to the customer to make sure that they're safe. The other thing I keep with me is a personal CO monitor. This is on my belt clip. It runs all the time, but I'm in a supermarket, friend's house, customer's house, because you don't know what kind of situations you're walking into. This is going to sound off and has sounded off many times to alert me when I'm in a dangerous situation. It starts sounding off at 20 parts per million and I know, hey, well, there's an issue. Let's get out of here. Let's then solve the issue. So a very important thing I'd recommend. Another piece of equipment I strongly recommend is a digital combustible gas leak detector. So when you turn this on, it makes a horribly annoying sound as it does its warm up. And then you can adjust the sensitivity. And this one's starting to get a low battery. The problem with electronics. But this, you can take it around all of the gas fittings and it's going to smell for any kind of gas leak. I also like to leave this running the whole time that I'm working so that if there's a gas leak or something starts happening, it notifies me before there's a fireball. Now, I don't just rely on this. I also want to keep with me gas leak detector. So it's essentially a type of soap bubbles, but it's designed specifically for gas fittings. What you do is when you put it on all of the fittings, it's going to bubble up if there's any kind of a leak. Now I don't like to use straight soap because I read in one of the manufacturer's literature that soap can react to or cause corrosion on some of the fittings. So I like to specifically use a gas leak detector rated for natural gas. So these are the things we want to have ready and with us while we're working to make sure that we're safe and the customer is safe. I also like to shut, if the unit's not running, I want to shut my gas off while I'm working and we're going to open up this panel and take a look inside. With this panel out of the way, we can see the components of the gas furnace. And the first thing I want to look at is this blinking light down here. Here we see an LED light and it's not blinking, which is a good thing. It's steady on. This particular manufacturer gives us the codes right here above that blinking light. So if we check these codes, it says continuous on control has 24 VAC power. So that means it has power, it's waiting for a call for heating or something to happen, and nothing's happened, so it's just on standby essentially. So that's a good thing. But once you take this door off, you'll see that that light goes away, and if it had any codes, it would clear or erase those codes. So I'm also gonna take this door off, and this is gonna shut the power off to the system. If we notice here we're missing one of the screws, I wanna make sure I put that screw back or find the replacement screw before I leave because it can be pulling air through that door. And we wanna make sure this compartment is sealed separate from our combustion compartment here. So we'll take this door off. Now when I've taken this door off, we have our door safety switch that opened and notice that our LED light went away. So that has shut off the power and all the operation for the systems. The next thing I want to do is take loose the R wire. So if I loosen this screw on the R terminal, I can pull the R wire off. Now in this case, the R wire happens to be red, but just because it's red doesn't mean it's the R wire. R from this control board connects to R at the thermostat. So that's an important lesson to learn. Sometimes people use different color wires, but as long as we connect R here to R at the thermostat, we'll have 24 volt power. The reason I'm taking this loose is so I can have control of this IFC. When I get ready to have a call for heat, I will use this to connect R to W to have that call for heat. So we're going to continue to get ready for our setup. 
Next thing I'm gonna do is get my gas pressure regulator set up. So I double check to make sure my gas is off. Then this side is gonna be my input pressure. Now normally, this port would be right on this combination gas valve here, but this system's been converted for LP. There's a sticker that says LP. An LP conversion usually comes with this additional pressure switch. This pressure switch shuts the unit off if we lose too much pressure in the propane tank, so it saves our system. This little elbow right here, street L, comes out to give us a nice convenient place to hook up our gas pressure to. So we're gonna use our standard service wrench for just about everything refrigeration. It also fits that port very nicely. The Gemini valves are different, but most of them you have this. Now if we take this loose, we don't have anything come out. If you had left the gas on, you would hear gas coming out. And because this is propane, it would fall down and spool up in this area, which can be a hazard. I'm then gonna put my adapter in here, and we're gonna screw that in. And we're gonna do that also a port for our manifold pressure. So this is output on this side. As we loosen this up, it's gonna give us output pressure of the combination gas valve, which is the same thing as this manifold pressure. It's the pressure going to the spuds and orifice so that we know exactly how much gas is going into this gas furnace. So we take this port off. I have another adapter we're gonna put here. Now I get my dual port manometer set up. This is gonna give me two different pressures. I'm going to zero this out and I'm going to turn on our lights. We're just going to put the magnet at the top so we can see. I'll use P2 for the manifold pressure. We just put our hose on a little barb fitting. And I'm going to put P1 for the pressure for my input side. So now we're set up. As soon as I get ready to power the system up, we can see what we have gas pressure wise. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my gas to see what my gas pressure is before the system even fires up. Then I'm gonna press P1 so I know the incoming pressure. And this is a huge problem. This says 11.74. This input gas pressure is too low. I should have about 13 inches of water column coming into my combination gas valve so that my combination gas valve can reduce this pressure down to 10 and a half or 11 depending on the manufacturer. So I don't have enough pressure coming in, I can't get enough pressure coming out. In this state, in Texas, I'm not allowed to adjust the pressure regulator on these propane tanks. They have different levels of certification by the Texas Railroad Commission, and we're not allowed to change that. Your state may be different, but don't try to adjust any of those pressures until you know exactly what your local laws are. So we're gonna to have to get the propane company to come out and adjust the pressure in that tank so that we can make sure we have the proper pressure to this unit. And sometimes it's not a problem with the tank. It could be the plumbing between the tank and this unit. So these are things that we wanna take into account. We're gonna continue our service to see what we have. One thing I know though, without the proper incoming pressure, I won't have the proper manifold pressure and I'm not gonna be able to do a combustion analysis. So that's kind of disappointing for us. Next thing I'm gonna do is take a look at our inducer fan motor. This is gonna pull a vacuum to our pressure switch. So I wanna see what that vacuum is. Our pressure switch closes at 0.27, but I wanna know how much, how much pressure it is. Now we can use our manometer, but to save time, I'm gonna use a Magna Helix. So this is a Magna Helix. It's what we used to use before the digital manometers came out. It's still a much better than the water manometers, but they were very hard to keep with you in the truck because vibrations would cause them to have sensitivity problems. It's got two ports, a low and a high. We're gonna use low port because it's vacuum. And what we're gonna do is disconnect the hose going to our pressure switch. And I'm gonna put the short hose onto my pressure switch. And the hose that went to the pressure switch to my T. I'm just gonna wrap this hose up over here out of the way, hook it up to my Magna Helix, and we'll set it over here so we can take a look at that when we're ready for it. I'm also going to want to check the amperage. I want to know the amperage of this motor and the amperage of the blower motor. So what I'm going to do is just take my meter, my amp meter, and clamp it around my main hot wire coming in. And I'm also going to want to check microamps. So I'm going to take this meter, set it up, and I have this little alligator clip. So I'm going to unplug the flame sensor, and the flame sensor is easy to identify because it has only one wire. So I unplug the flame sensor, and I take my alligator clip and attach it to my flame sensor. Then I take the other side 
and hook it to my meter and it just plugs right in to that same port I unplugged it from. Set my meter for UA, that U stands for micro and A is amps and it's DC. So when I get to that point, I'm already reading micro amps and I don't have any disruption. So we're just about ready for that next step. What I'm gonna do is power up the board. And by doing that, I have to close this door safety switch. It's very important to not use tape. I really dislike it when people, people use tape, technicians use tape, because once they tape that, we bypass that safety. Too many times I've done service calls and see tape left there. So I like to use a magnet. A magnet means I can't put this door back on properly because the magnet's holding it too far away. So a magnet for me works really, really great to make sure I don't forget and leave that tape there. Remember, if you were to have a customer work on this or you were to leave a screw off or something happens and you leave this door off, it's possible to pull combustion air or carbon monoxide back into the house because of that. So it's very important that we don't leave that tape. So I'm gonna put my magnet on. It's gonna hold that switch closed. And we see our LED light comes on. My gas is on. I have all of my instrumentation ready to go. So one more thing we're gonna check is our draft. This particular unit has a single wall because it's outside of the house shell. By code, it doesn't have to be a double wall at this section. I still prefer it to be a double wall because if we lose too much heat out of this flue pipe, we could have condensation. That's another topic. This is gonna be my draft sensor. I put it inside, right now we're on zero. If there's positive pressure, it goes this way, which there should never be positive pressure on an 80% furnace. This inducer fan motor does not pressurize this pipe. It still relies on natural convection. So my draft is running, I should be over here in the negative side, being it's a vacuum, naturally drafting out, pulling it out. So we're ready to fire this up. I'm gonna have the thermostat call for heat, connect r &W. It's gonna energize our inducer fan motor, pull a vacuum or a pressure switch that we can read. We can also read our amperage. The thing I'm looking for for the amperage is making sure it's not over amping. So I'm gonna see what the motor's rated for. The motor is rated for 1.52. So I'll make sure I do not exceed that number. Now we connect R to W. So if we see here, we're pulling 1.58 amps. So we're over amping on that. So that kind of worries me, 1.58. We're rated for 1.52. So I'm going to take a look at that motor a little bit later and see what's going on with that motor. As we pull a draft, we're at 0.5 inches of water column. We close at 0.27, so that's good. I'm pulling plenty of vacuum to my pressure switch. My hot service igniter energizes. We see our amps go up to energize that hot service igniter. It's on this side, the two wires on this side. So next, our combination gas valve should energize. Now we have gas flowing through the manifold to the spuds and orifice. I'm going to turn this to P2 and check our manifold pressure. Oh, notice the unit cycled off because I did not have this attached properly. So we're going to put this in to make sure we get a good connection. And there is another thing that you can do if you have an issue with this pulling out. What you can do is you can actually put in another alligator clip. And on my connector, I can actually put in here a fuse and put my alligator clip on that fuse. So we see that our microamps is 5.2 microamps so it's 5.2 microamps so i know i got a good flame sense going on and we know that we have our motor running we have the proper vacuum there our manifold pressure is at 10.25 so our manifold pressure is too low i can't adjust that because i don't have enough coming in next thing that kicks on is going to be our blower motor our blower motor kicks on and starts moving the heat across the heat exchanger into the house so if we see our total amperage is 4.4 amps, but that's not accurate because we don't have our door on. So we're gonna recheck that later with our door on to make sure we get an accurate reading. So this is the majority of what we need, but there's one more thing that I'm gonna do. A lot of companies don't do this, but I find it to be very beneficial. These bearings and these inducer fan motors go out pretty often. So I have this thesoscope, mechanical thesoscope, and with this, I can put it up against that motor and I can hear the bearings. And this motor bearing sounds very good. I can't describe to you what it sounds like when they're bad, but when you hear one, you know, hey, that's not normal. And it gives me something I can inform the customer. Hey, everything's working good now, but we're having this issue. In this case, I was hoping that my high amperage would be related to the bearings, but it's not. We'll probably end up pulling 
the flue pipe off and taking a look at that motor to make sure it's working okay. And it could also be because of the improper combustion for our system. If we look over here, we are getting a draft. We're getting about 0.2 inches of the water column draft. So we are having a natural draft coming out. Normally what I would do is use my combustion analyzer and put my probe inside the stack and I could do a combustion analysis. But because my gas pressure is not going to be right, I know I won't have any way of getting that accurate. So as we take a look at this furnace, another thing I want to look at is the wires. So we look for the terminal that says heating. So we have common, heat, and cool. The heat terminal is what I'm looking at. And on the heat terminal, we are using a yellow wire. And if I look on the back of our board, on our wiring diagram, it says to our motor, that terminal going to heating is yellow, and it's going to terminal number four. So yellow is terminal number four. We're going to be using that here in just a little bit. So we see everything's running pretty nice. What I can do is I can put this door on and I can see if my amperage changes on my gas furnace. But a lot of times these connectors are in the way and it may shut off. We'll see if it works this time. You can see how the blower is affecting the flames of this gas furnace. So this is why we like to keep that door on there because it will definitely affect how this furnace runs. So we check our amperage again. Our amperage is running at five amps, just below five amps, we'll call it five amps. So I got five amps total. We know our inducer fan motor is 1.58, so we're just gonna subtract those two numbers. So that means our blower motor is pulling 3.1 amps. If we take a look on our tag, sometimes it tells us what the maximum amps for the blower is. The maximum amps for the unit is 13.4. We're at 4.9, so that's not an issue. Motor horsepower, voltage phase, it does not tell us what the amperage is for the motor on this data tag. So we'll have to look that up someplace else. So, so far everything here is running really good. The next thing we need to check is going to be temperature rise and our pressure. Now to do that, I have to reset. And so what I'm gonna do is cycle this furnace off. So I'm just gonna click the off switch here and it shuts off our flames immediately. While I'm doing that, I can now unplug some of my other instrumentation that I don't need, such as my flame sensor. I can put that back where it goes. Our light's blinking because we did lose flame sense. And I'm also going to shut the gas off and we're going to take my manometer off because we're going to need that for something else. It's very important to put these plugs back in. I've had, I've seen before where helpers will be getting into their first maintenance call. They're so excited to do their first gas check. They leave one of these ports off and when they come back or as soon as they leave and it fires up, gas is coming out of here and it fills this area up and you have a flame rollout. And they've had to replace furnaces because of this. So definitely want to make sure you don't forget this step. Right now the unit's going through a cool down mode. The IFC is running the blower to cool down the heat exchanger and then it's going to go through a restart. If we're lucky, we can get everything put back together before it tries to restart. So now we've reset our system, blower's off, inducer fan motor's coming on, it's going to recycle. The next thing I want to check is going to be our temperature rise. So we're going to need for this two thermometers. So I got one here and my other one is right here. What I like about this meter is it will check two temperatures at the same time. So I'm going to take my meter and turn it to temperature, T1 and T2 Fahrenheit leave it clamped over here and I'm going to check a temperature of my return air 
this has a positive and a negative. I'm going to put positive and positive, negative and negative. I got to turn it to temperature. So we plug that in and I'm going to plug it right past the filter where the temperature of the air comes into the unit. The other one I'm going to put in a supply air after the evaporator coil. So I'll make sure I get a good mixture of proper temperature of air. And we still haven't come on because I forgot to turn this back to the on position. That's all right. We'll turn our gas back on as well because we're going to need that. So it says right now the temperature of my return air is 66 and the supplier is 83, but the unit's not working. So that's just natural draft that we have going up. As soon as the system cycles back on, we'll fire it up and see what happens. The system's fired back up. We have our flames running through. We have flame sense. It's gonna heat up the heat exchanger. Our blower is gonna come on and we're gonna let it run for a little bit and we're gonna get our temperature rise. Temperature rise is the same thing as delta T. Delta means the same and T is temperature. So temperature, delta T, the temperature of the air coming in versus the air going out. It's just a difference in the two. For some reason, gas furnaces call it temperature rise. How much it's risen the temperature from the air coming in versus the air coming out. You got to understand it's the same thing, reworded or worded the same thing differently. So temperature rise and delta T are the same thing. How much, what's the temperature difference between the air coming into the furnace and the air coming out of the furnace? So we're going to let this run a little bit and let it build up. But I need something to compare this number to when I do get this number. So what I'm going to look at is on the furnace tag, it's going to tell us what our temperature rise is. And it says here, air temperature rise in Fahrenheit. It should be 30 to 60. So I'm gonna write that number down, 30 to 60. So the air coming out should be between 30 to 60 degrees higher than the air coming in. If we get the air too high, the temperature of the air is getting too hot, so we're gonna overheat our furnace. So we need more fan speed. If our temperature is too low coming out, that means I need to slow the fan speed down because we're cooling that flame off too much. So these are things we wanna look at. Now, before I speed that fan up, if I have too high of a temperature rise, I also wanna look for airflow, airflow, airflow. Check the filter, check the evaporator cooler, check the ductwork, make sure all the vents are open, things like that. But we would definitely wanna make sure with, within this range, 30 to 60 degrees. So the unit's been running for a little bit. Let's do some math and see what our temperature rise is. So our supplier temperature is about 120, it's climbing, so it's gonna be 124 degrees. 124, and our return air temperature is 70. So take 124 minus 70. So our delta T, or our temperature rise, is 54 degrees. Now that's a little higher than I like, but we're still within the range. It's between 30 to 60, so we're still within a range but I want to take a look and see, hey, is our airflow working right? Making sure that we're okay because we have a pretty high temperature rise. But that's how we do temperature rise. Very simple number, but a very important number. Again, too high, we're overheating our furnace. Too low, we're going to end up with soot in that furnace and we're because we're taking too much heat away. So it's a very important number we're going to look at. The next thing I want to look at is static pressure. So where I had my port set, I'm going to take those out for my temperature and we're gonna now hook up our manometer yet again. So take my manometer, I'm gonna zero this out. And what we're gonna do is use these little adapters here. This is what we're gonna be using. This is our static pressure probes and it has an arrow, so this is going towards my airflow. I have one down here at the return air past the filter and the other one is after the furnace, but before the evaporator coil. What we're looking for is external static pressure and the evaporator coil is external to the furnace. So we have drilled a hole between the furnace and the evaporator coil to get that pressure port. 
Now it's very important to you when you're drilling that hole, you do not drill into the drain pan because you're going to cause a big problem or worse, drill into the coil itself. I prefer when installing a unit to have a little metal box between the furnace and the evaporator coil so we can get this number. Also, we can use that for an access point to take a look at the underside of this evaporator coil. But I didn't install this furnace. I don't have any say in how it's done. So we're going to take one. I'm going to hook it up to this hose and we're going to put it in the return air. And the other one, the hose, the, the, the other one, the port's already there. We're just going to plug it into our hose. And I'm looking for not just one side. The top one's reading my P1 versus P2, but the bottom one's giving my pressure difference. So on the one side, I'm getting 0.25. On the other side, it's 0.36. But this is what I'm looking for, 0.6. My external static pressure is 0.6. That number is going to be very, very important. And here's why. Earlier, we knew that there was a yellow wire in this door, which means it was terminal number four. And we know that we have 0.6 inches of water column for external static pressure. Now with this chart from the manufacturer, we can actually find the CF films of this gas furnace. You can pull this up on your phone or you can get this information off of the installation manual that comes with the furnace. So what we're going to do is see what our static pressure was, which was 0.6. And we have this whole entire column that's 0.6. So to simplify this, I'm just going to highlight that for you real quick. So we know that our number is going to fall somewhere in here. The next thing it says, the size of the unit. I know that this unit is 100,000, 110,000 B2s input. So we're going to be right here in this side. So now it says, what speed terminal are we using? Well, I know that we were using speed terminal number four. So I'm going to highlight speed terminal number four. So this is the unit we're using, speed total number four, all of this line down here is our static pressure. So if we see where these two numbers cross, I know that this unit is moving 1,275 CFM, cubic feet per minute. I know exactly what the airflow is of this unit. If I change the speed of this blower, it's going to adjust those. It's a really cool way of finding your airflow. It's a very simple way of finding your airflow. And it's also extremely accurate. So these are the main things we're looking to check on this gas furnace. Now some other maintenance points that we're going to look at. We're going to cycle this unit off again. One of the things that I want to check is this flame sensor. They're notorious for getting carbon built up on there. So what we're going to do is loosen this screw. And it's still going to be warm because it was just running. So we pull this out. Now this is extremely dirty. What we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on this so you can get a good picture of it. So there's a lot of carbon built up on here. Now this is from a few things. One, just running over time, that flame burning against it can build this up. Number two, we're in a shop environment. So anything that's out here, dust, uh, anything working with wood, any of that stuff can burn against that as well and cause this coating. And number three, we don't have the proper gas pressure. So that could be causing incomplete combustion, which can also cause this to, to build up soot on there. So what we're going to do is use an abrasive pad, never sandpaper. What we're just going to do is we're just going to take this, we're just going to clean this up a little bit. If you touch this with your finger, you could get a shock because there's anywhere from 90 volts to 115 volts. We're going to go ahead and pull this door off so it doesn't fire up on us. Our magnet comes off of the door, which is nice and convenient. Now you can see that I've cleaned this flame sensor up and it's nice and clean. If I was to use sandpaper or sand cloth, the problem would be that the sand would leave a coating on here and sand is made with silica. Once that silica gets ignited by the flames burning across, it'll burn it into glass, which gives us the improper reading. So having this nice and clean 
saves us a whole lot of worry. Also, I want to inspect this porcelain. I've never broken a porcelain, but it's possible for somebody to drop this, hits the ground, and cracks. Once it cracks, it could ground out and give us an improper reading. I've also seen people grab these with pliers, which breaks that porcelain all the time. So these are things we want to inspect. Putting it back in, we just work it back in that same hole. Make sure it's in front of the burners. And we put the one single screw back in. This is where magnetic nut drivers is extremely important in our trade. Now the hot service igniter is the next thing I want to talk about. There's no maintenance we can do to this. They last about five years. So I like to put a running log in here when the last time it's replaced. And if I replace this every five years, I don't have to worry about it going out in the middle of the night. Now in the older days, what we would do is we would unplug these and we would ohm them out. The next thing I want to talk about is the hot surface igniter. In the old days, we would unplug this and we would ohm it out. We'd set our meter to ohms, the upside down horseshoe. Use our magnet to hold this for us. I would take and firmly hold one connection against one side and firmly hold the other side, the other connection to the other side. And some were easier than others. This one's wanting to be ornery. And I'm reading 56.8 ohms of resistance. Now, I don't like to ohm these out today because there's so many different types and varieties and kinds of these hot surface igniters. That number that we get, 58, isn't going to be relevant to us until we have something to compare it to. So I'd, I'm looking forward to somebody making an app of all the different brands of hot surface igniters so we can look it up to see what the resistance should be. But since we don't have anything to compare it to, that number is not going to be useful anymore like it was. In the old days, we had one type of hot service igniter. We could ohm it out, and if our if it ohmed out weak, we could change it out at that point. I was talking to Jim Bergman, and he's the one that recommends not worrying about it anymore. Now, these are polarity, so we want to make sure that we get them the plug. They're not polarity, it's alternating current, but the plug is sized a certain direction, so it has to go back in that same way. It's also important to say these wires are close to the door, so when I'm putting that door on, I want to make sure that I clear that. So before I put that door back in, the next thing that I want to do is take my jumper wires off. We're then going to put the customer's R wire back so it goes back to the thermostat. And I also want to inspect this control board to make sure we don't have any dust or dirt on here. Now the few things in this control board is one is this fuse right here. If we look closely, It has the letter E on it, but that's incorrect. It's actually the letter three. So I'm gonna unplug this and turn it around, and now we can see it's the letter three. I was at the supply house once, and a guy came in asking for an E fuse. Nobody knew what he was talking about, and then finally the guy behind the counter turned it around and said, do you mean a three amp fuse? So everybody laughed about that, and it's all been an ongoing joke ever since. But it is a three, because fuses are sized and it's a three amp fuse. But one of the first things you want to do is check that fuse. And you also want to check if there's any burnt spots. And another thing you can do, if you have a board you think's bad, you can take the screws off, look on the back side of that board. It's important to make sure all the power is off and you're grounded before you do that because just yourself touching that can cause a short. We also like to pull the blower out and inspect it, or at least put a mirror up inside so that we can see what the blower oil looks like. So we can take a mirror or an indioscope or some kind of a camera on the end of your phone, we can check the blower wheel. What we used to do is we used to also take the blower completely out, do maintenance, and then we would crawl into the blower section and look up to inspect the heat exchanger, look for any kind of holes. At the same time, we would vacuum out all the insulation on this unit. It's also very important that we check the filter. We can see this is the filter for the customer's unit, and this filter is definitely dirty, so we're going to need to put a new filter in for them check with your boss and see what their requirements are but most companies i've worked with we would sell boxes of filters to the customer we like these good pleated filters because they catch a lot of dirt without restricting airflow so you can't just simply go with the higher effectively filter you need to make sure your airflow is properly as well you can go up to merv 13 but a merv 13 filter requires a larger filter base so i couldn't just put this filter inside the unit 
This filter is a two inch filter, so it's significantly wider. So this filter, if we look on it, is a MERV 8 filter. A MERV 8 filter is decent for filtering a lot of dirt, protecting the unit. It's not gonna pull out any kind of pollens, but it's also not gonna change airflow. Before you change the MERV setting of a unit, you're gonna to wanna to check the pressure drop across that unit. I've seen too many times people put filters in that are too restrictive, it actually burns up the unit. Now when I put this new filter in, I don't just wanna slide this filter in, I wanna make sure that I date it. So I'm gonna put my name on here, my initials and the date, not just on one side, but I wanna put it on all four sides. The reason is the customer can come and say, well, you never changed that filter. And if you have your name and date on it all the way around, there's no denying that you did change that filter. So it's an important little step. Also, the metal on these filters needs to be on the top side or where airflow is going. So if it's downflow, the air flows down. So the air is going this way. If it's upflow, the metal goes up. So the air is going this way. This is an upflow. The reason is that metal holds the shape of this filter. It is possible if you put it upside down that it could pull the filter material separate from the metal and not filter as well. So we're gonna slide this filter in. So now we wanna make sure that before we put everything back together, we do a little bit of basic cleaning. One more thing I wanna show you on this IFC. Control boards can be set up different ways. This particular model has a blower off delay and we can change how long that blower runs before it cycles off. Right now it's set for 120 seconds. So once my flame shuts off, the blower runs for 120 seconds before it cycles off. The reason they allow this for us to change this is because of efficiency and comfort. If you have a customer that complains that, hey, this furnace is blowing out cold air before it shuts off, you can decrease that blower time. So that way when the flame shut off, the blower runs for a shorter period of time so the air still feels hot to them. Now for efficiency, it'd be better to move it down over here closer to 180. Moving it down means you're getting every last little bit of heat out of that heat exchanger. The problem is the temperature of that air gets very close to room temperature. And as you're moving temp plane temperature across your body, it feels cold. So this one's set for 120. We're not gonna change that. We haven't had any issues with the customer complaining, so we're gonna leave it at 120. But I like to see them moved a little bit longer for efficiency, and then especially if it's elderly people, I like to move a little bit down closer to the shorter off delay. But that's things you can change, and every control board has a different um, characteristics of how it runs and how it's set up. So check the installation manual because there's so much valuable information on that. All right, so we're also just gonna do a quick little clean on here. I like to use as least amount of chemicals as possible around the blower section. One thing I like to use is this one. It doesn't have, it's non-toxic and I don't believe there's any oil in there or very little, but I like to clean everything up, all this dust, clean it out. And this one's pretty dirty because this has been in a shop environment. So what we really need to do is we're gonna need to take this panel off and pull these burners out and clean them. We'll see if we can reach our hand up in here, but it's pretty tight fitting. Another thing you can do to clean some of the connections is use a paintbrush. A paintbrush works really great for cleaning around all these little tight areas. A paintbrush works perfect for getting all the dust between these little connectors as well. I don't mind using a little bit extra on the tops of the furnace because it's going to take a little bit more and it's also further away from the burners. I wanna make sure that when that customer comes and looks at it, it looks nice and clean because they don't get to see everything we do inside of this furnace. So it's important that when they do come out and look at it, they see, oh, that looks nice and clean. He did something. Now when I clean the inside of this compartment, I wanna be very careful I don't put any chemical in here. I don't wanna mess up this wiring schematic under any conditions. This is gonna be your lifesaver. It's a really great idea that while you're an apprentice or while you're learning to start following these out and getting comfortable with these now so when you're ready for it, you know what's gonna happen. We have a ladder diagram which is basically telling us the sequence of operation. This side is nice because it shows you exactly what color wire is used and where they go on the IFC. So it's really easy to follow if somebody takes something off or leaves the wires off. Sequence of operation, how it's supposed to work, putting those wires back. 
So we're just gonna take and just put a little bit of cleaner around. And I also wanna make sure I don't put any cleaner on that window. I don't wanna take a chance on that plastic being darkened or changing color to where you can't see inside of it. I'm gonna find just the edge of this. It doesn't have any cleaner on it and just wipe this down. You can see it's already fogged up because somebody's probably cleaned it once before or just simply it's plastic. Over time, age could cause that. Notice I didn't use any cleaner on this side because there's all of these words. I don't want to take a chance in that cleaner smearing any of this and making it hard for that next guy because the next guy might be me. Tons of information for the system for altitude, your, for your blinking lights, your codes, your input BTU ratings, temperature rise, gas pressures, lots of information on this. Don't overlook this. Start learning and getting familiar with it. We're going to put this door back on. We made sure our wires hooked up. We're going to put this door back on and make sure that we add those missing screws. Okay. Now, if we notice when I put this door back on, there's a call from heat inside, but it's not going to fire up because I have the combination gas valve off. That's what I want. I don't want this furnace to fire up while I'm standing in front of it. Anytime a furnace fires up, you want to be standing off to the side. So if there is a flame rollout, it doesn't burn you. Now I'm off to the side, turn the gas to on. We should see this system fire up. So we see everything firing up, no flames rolled out, which is good. We want to make sure that we take our tool back off. There's going to be a plug or a cap that we're going to put on this. And we're also going to put our main cover back on. While this is running, I take my sprayer and put a little bit of cleaner on the rag. So it's not going to be pulled into the burners. And I keep my face away just in case there's a reaction. It's not going to go to my face. We want to make sure that we clean this door, make this door look again really, really nice. Now these louvers are kind of a pain to have to clean. This one's not too bad. I can get my finger up in there and we can just wipe these down pretty easily. But this is also another little benefit where that paintbrush comes in. That paintbrush will clean these out very easily, very cleanly. Now if this is installed in a furnace closet, you typically don't have this issue of this being dirty like this. And also if it's in the attic, it may still get dirty like this, but it's less likely the customer getting upset if it's not in perfect conditions. And there's also going to be lots of insulation and dust in that attic as well. Next thing I want to do is go to the thermostat inside and make sure the hole behind the thermostat is sealed. A lot of times people don't seal that hole and as there's air moving in and out of that house, it pulls an improper temperature across that thermostat, which makes the customer feel uncomfortable. Let's do a quick little recap. We wanted to make sure that we had checked for carbon monoxide, make sure the customer has carbon monoxide detectors and you also have a personal low level CO monitor. We checked to make sure our inducer fan motor is pulling the proper amps without over amping. This one was over amping, so we did record that. The customer wasn't interested in replacing that at this time, but we did see a little bit of soot when we looked inside that flue pipe. That soot's most likely caused because we don't have the proper gas pressure. The customer's gonna call their propane person to come take care of that, and then we're gonna come back and recheck that and do a combustion analysis. We also checked the vacuum to our pressure switch to make sure our pressure switch was closing correctly, and we had the proper vacuum going to the pressure switch. We cleaned their flame sensor and we also checked our microamps to our flame sensor. We took a look at our hot service igniter. We did ohm it out, which doesn't really do anything for us these days. Some companies like to also record the amperage of that. We checked the amps of the inducer fan motor, also the amps of the blower motor. We also checked to see what our CFM was. We also checked our temperature rise, make sure temperature rise is good. We checked incoming gas pressure, outcoming gas pressure, and we also cleaned the unit. We inspected the blower. The blower does need to be cleaned. We also changed the filter. We're then gonna take our CO monitor and we're gonna go inside the house and walk all over the house to make sure there's no carbon monoxide. Remember, if you're getting carbon monoxide, it's not just because of the furnace. It can also be because of the water heater, back pressure, 
uh, system as their customers working with the bathroom fans, the exhaust fans for the kitchen, it could actually put the house at a negative pressure and be pulling carbon monoxide back through into the vent pipes. Also fireplaces. Many things can cause carbon monoxide. We don't just want to assume it's the furnace. This furnace is installed in an open area, but if this was in a closet, I want to check to make sure I have the proper upper and lower combustion air to make sure the size of that combustion air is big enough. And if the water heater was gassed in the same closet, we'd also have to calculate that with it to make sure we had enough gas pressure. The other thing I like to do is when I'm checking the unit gas pressure while it's running, I like to go ahead and fire up or run some water so the water heater lights up as well. The reason is I want to make sure that there's nothing causing a gas pressure to drop while the system is running. That's the basics of our maintenance. If we had other issues, we want to address them as we come across them. For example, another thing I like to do is inspect this evaporator coil. A dirty evaporator coil can cause problems with your heating. In other words, the evaporator coil gets dirty, you can't move enough air across that evaporator coil and you're going to have problems overheating your furnace as well as not getting that heat into your customer's house. You also want to look for any safety issues, any kind of a gas leak, anything that could cause a problem with, a, with an explosion or any dangerous situation. So I like to use my electronic leak detector and also like to use the liquid bubbles. I didn't bring any liquid bubbles with me, that's a failure on my part. Not having one simple thing can cause your job to be complicated and compromised. You want to make sure you're having the tools and supplies you need to do this job correctly. So um, that pretty well covers everything. We want to make sure we're, uh, we're running safe and efficiently as possible. This system will need a combustion analysis when the customer gets that gas pressure fixed. Then we can do a combustion analysis and make sure we set our gas pressure according to the manufacturer specifications solid everything's tight and this is another great point when you're working on gas furnaces and your customer has cats you'll have to worry about that i've seen before where cats will crawl into the blower housing when it fires up also i've pulled the blower out to do maintenance and had a cat actually crawl through the heat exchanger and get hung up in the furnace itself so these are it's a really good learning point of the aggravation sometimes with pets so what i like to ask the customer to do is if they have pets could they put it away in another room Sometimes that offends customers, but it's real embarrassing when you lose a cat.